we going to be using the Romans book? Uh, just right in the beginning. No, just I'll read from Romans 7. Wait just a few minutes and we'll start. All right. Well, it's good to be back from out of town. I'm sorry we missed last Sunday, but hope all of you had a good time. Don and I forgot that the time changed, so I got up this morning looking at another clock, and I thought, oh my gosh, I got 10 minutes to get ready. <laughs> so I didn't know about that, but we uh, had a good trip up to, to the Mayo Clinic, found out a lot of things, and uh, I, I always recommend people, if you have something that your doctors can't find out, go to a Mayo Clinic or a Cleveland Clinic, somewhere where a lot of doctors are, because they can take care very quick. So good to see all of you come on. Uh, there, we're continuing our study on the unveiling of the revelation Jesus revealed to the Apostle Paul. And for some of you that might be new to listening to this today, uh, the Apostle Paul was taught by Jesus and uh, after Jesus resurrected himself and then he apprehended Paul, Paul went out into the desert with Jesus and Jesus taught him and explained to him what he was trying to teach the people because uh, they couldn't understand him because all they wanted was help, you know, help in all, all kinds of areas of life. And they, wouldn't inter they were not interested in spiritual matters. And so Paul came along to teach spiritual matters. And, of course, there was a veil put over that, which was the translations, the false perceptions, and everything that religiousity does to the Word of God. So we are uncovering that. Hi, Tina. Sue, got some new people over here today. So uh, last night, as I was sitting down, I almost didn't teach because I'm a little bit tired from our trip, but I just sat there and listened to the Father, read through some of the old Paul Sith and Truth teachings, and a word popped out, which was marriage, and popped out very big. If you'll remember, if you ever studied under Brother Garner, he liked to use the <clears throat> verses in Romans 7 where Paul was comparing marriage to the law and how, how you can be dead to the law. And, of course, he used uh, a marriage between a man and a woman. And what happened is religiousity took hold of that, and they made it real. And they made it that if you got a divorce, you were an adulterer or adulteress. Or There are so many pastors today that's had divorces that their religion will not let him preach anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that is just f uh, far from what the Apostle Paul was trying to share with us. We know the, the Bible is uh, filled with metaphors and symbolism and uh, parables. Jesus used parables all the time to help explain spiritual truths because, again, a lot of people, they have to have some kind of picture. And I've said that all my life. I, At a time, I needed those pictures uh, to bring some kind of understanding, but now we understand, and now we're able to mine these out. So I do want to talk today about married unto our Father and the fruit that we bear and the spiritual symbolism or the metaphor, metaphor behind this story. And if you have my uh, Romans translation book, if you don't, you should order it. It would bless you, but you can read in Romans chapter 7. And I'm going to start this uh, chapter. It's a new chapter out in my next book, uh, which uh, was sharing from the Bible translation, the seventh letter of the Apostle Paul. And he wrote these to the community of believers in Rome, but they're for everyone. You know, we can always say, well, he wrote, you know, people all the time say, well, they wrote those things to them. They did, but they're for us, and we can learn from them. So I'll read this. In Romans chapter 7, verse 1. I write the following to those who tread about in life, being careful to mind the law of the Mosaic system with all its demands and all of its dictates. <clears throat> I call to your attention the fact that the law of Moses, the influence of the mythological and paganistic beliefs, and the do-to-be efforts exercise lordship over those who follow them in such a way that they live under those dead systems. And we've all experienced living under something, haven't we? In America, we live under a, a political system that is very controlling, very troubling. We live under other systems that, you know, the, the uh, social system today is very troubling. So you're under that. And we don't want to be under those things. We want to live above those things. But Paul was telling that you've been living under those situations and those efforts and the, 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 the demands to to heed to what they tell you to do. Then verse two, an example he used according to the Mosaic law would be, if a married woman whose husband is alive is bound to her husband by that marriage, uh, law marriage. However, if her husband dies, the law of marriage for her is rendered entirely idle or useless. And when I'm talking about something dying, we're talking about an awareness. 
my awareness of, of that I had for my first many, many years of my life up until 1996 died. And then my awareness from 1996 to about 2004 or five of the word died. And now I'm living out of the greater awareness. And so that's what you, I want you to talk, uh, understand when it talks about dying. So, and according to verse 3, to the Mosaic law of Moses concerning marriage, if while her husband is still alive and she enters into a sexual union, which we could say she has a man enter penetrate her awareness, which we've all had that happen with another man, she will be called an adulterer. And that's why, that's why uh, the Bible talked about Israel as an adulterous generation. Why? Because they fed from all different other sources than Father. They went after all the paganistic gods and mythological gods, and they mixed it in with their belief system. So that's why the Bible used the word adulterer. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. So that is not improper for her, so that it is not improper for her if she joins together to another man. So once we leave the law... You know, some people say, well, you need to stick with your church. You need to, and they make you feel like you're improper because you're going to hear a greater truth. I've had people say, why do you go listen to Roy Richmond? Because he believes this. One of them said he doesn't even believe in a devil. Why would you go listen to him? So it's kind of like improper. But in those people's mindsets, if the law dies in their old belief system, then they no longer will feel that way. And they will over, no longer condemn people that come and feed from the truth. And a lot of people resist coming to here because what their family thinks about them or what their church system thinks about them. And that's one of the reasons I think it says we must give up father, mother, brother, sister for the gospel or for the truth. That doesn't mean I'm going to give up my parents, but I, I'm not going to let them control what I'm going to learn, going to learn. So he said, remember, I'm only using marriage under the Mosaic law as an example. I'm not writing concerning the ins and outs of divorce. I'm picturing to you how the Mosaic law of being dead has no more effect on you. And people need to hear that. Preachers need to hear that because they're constantly condemning people for getting a divorce. And yet they're doing worse than that. I promise you. So by no means that the Apostle Paul laying down any type of law to be a guideline for marriage. He's only using marriage as an allegory on how all people are free from the Mosaic law and the doing of the law. Now, did the law continue? Well, yeah, I'm sure it did. It does today. People still want some kind of law. Uh, I, I forget the writer. I think it was Malcolm Smith talked about how people want fences. All they want is tell me how far I can go. Which sin am I okay with and which sin is not forgivable? All that stuff. So they still think that they have to have a law. So it's still alive in people's understanding, but it is not from Father God. Yeah. And it is not a force if you don't let it be. And so Jesus revealed that law facility. Those laws were not from Father. They were from Moses and others who possessed a false perception of Father and what Father wanted for them and also for, for what Father wants for us today. Father just wants us to enter into rest. Father wants us to allow him to be our, uh, him to be our husbandman, if you would, and our source. So we know what marriage is between a man and woman. You know, we know that very much. But however... Do we know what other than the physical meaning of marriage is? And Jesus often talked about marriages, right? He, uh, one of his first miracles was at the marriage supper at Canaan, right? Canaan, where he turned the, uh, the water into wine. And to me, that's a picture of turning the, the, the written word into the living word. You know, there are other meanings for that too. But he often talked about these and he, and, and he showed them uh, metaphor, metaphorical understandings by speaking parables. And the symbolism of marriage is a union of two states of consciousness. That's what we've got to understand spiritually. Two states of consciousness are two dominant forms of consciousness. And there is now a marriage union in our awareness when we open the door to our subconscious. A lot of people won't open the door. They won't open the door to their, their brain, their, their thoughts, their belief system. And Jesus said, I am the door. In other words, I am the teacher. I am, I, what I'm coming to teach you is the way, and he said, I'm the way again, and I'm the truth, and I'm the life. I'm the way for you to understand the truth. But many people, they don't want to open the door at all. You know, we used to sing a song when we were young, shut the door and keep out the devil. What we were doing is we were shutting the door and keeping out Father, right? We should have shut the door to rel religiosity because that was the devil. So we do this by consciously affirming the presence and the power of our divine mind 
which is I exist in the midst of us. And, you know, we, a lot of people on Sundays, they come listen to me, they listen to Kay. Uh, hi, Mel. Mel Judkins is with us today. She told me she would come someday. She's here. <laughs> so, Melanie. <laughs> Melanie. Uh, that got me off track there. <laughs> what did I just say? Did you understand what I just said? I forget. It was a good point I was going to say. That doesn't matter. So, I exist. Oh, I know what it is. A lot of people spend their time mainly in listening to sermons or going to church or whatever. But on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't really affirm this presence and this power all the time. When I uh, sat in front of these doctors and they told me I was going to have to have that myoctomy in my heart where they're going to go inside of it, I just continued to, to think, but God is the supreme power. Father is my power. And I thank those doctors for us until we know that we know that we know. But I have no fear whatsoever. And not too many people can say that because I believe that Father gave them that supernatural power to go inside my heart and carve that extra meat off, if you would, and let the blood flow. It, it, it didn't come from anywhere else, did it? Mm -hmm. So if God gave it to him, then it's intended to use for us until we fully awaken to who we are. Mm -hmm. So when this eternal union is released, and when we daily affirm the very presence of our Father inside of us, that's when our true source, our force, our energy literally is quickened inside of us. It's there, but sometimes it's not quickened. Right, We know it's there, but we don't make a withdrawal. And so it's quickened into every part of our being. And the life that exists in us is then allowed to flow. That's just what's going on in my heart. At the bottom cavity of my heart, it's supposed to be the size of an avocado or the shape, but it's the size of a, a uh, hourglass. And so it's hindering the flow. Therefore, the heart beats harder and harder and harder. Same thing with us. If the flow's hindered, what do we do? We try harder and we try harder and we labor and we do what religious that he tells us to do and we fast and we pray and we bind and all that stuff. And what does it do? It wears you out. Brother Garner called it shadow boxing. I've never done it, but if you're boxing and you're not hitting anything, it'll really wear you out. There has to be some kind of contact made. <laughs> so we want to allow this flow. And when we allow this flow, it's like torrents of living water flowing through your body. When my blood begins to flow the way it's supposed to be, it's going to be oxygenated blood flowing to my body, and I promise you I'm going to feel it. It's going to feel good. You ever been to an oxygen bar before? You've never done it? I, I haven't, but I saw it, and I asked people about it. They, but when you breathe oxygen going, flowing through water, and literally they feel the energy of that pure oxygen flowing through them. And so the, the life of God is that way. So have you felt that in your body before? That, that flowing, that quickening? I, I have. And I, I, I say it's beautiful. You know, I, some people call it goosebumps. Some people call it the anointing, you know, whatever it is. But it's that flow that we've tapped into. So I found it yesterday. I was looking at some different names. And I found in Isaiah 62, 4, we find the name of Beulath, B-E-U-L-A-T-H. And it literally in the Hebrew, it means married. And it's attached, the name is attached to the land and nation of Israel. That's what uh, Father instructed Isaiah to call Israel. And what it was, it signified the perfect union with Father to which the Israelites will return. Because they needed to return. Because they were always going after false gods, false images. They would go up to mountains all the time and worship these false images. So again, this name Beuloth means marriage. It signifies the rich and happy state of the individual who enters into conscious union with the divine mind. It literally means married. And so, uh, or we could say one in whom the marriage of the lambkin has taken place. And if you remember, I shared with you all a few weeks ago when it talked about the lamb that slain before the foundation of the world or at the foundation, it didn't say before the foundation of the world. It said at the foundation. Lambkin means a, a person. It's the child. It's the child of the adult lamb. So we were lambkin. And the lambkin at the foundation of the world, they were slain because they believed a lie. They self-condemned themselves and they lowered themselves into a lower awareness. That's what it means to be slain. So in this sense, the marriage of the lambkin, which would be us, has taken place where the lambkin uh, have entered into our eternal oneness with Father, and that's a marriage. You know, when Don and I got married, when Carl and Ann got married, and any of you got married, there had to become a time when you kind of, your your thoughts and your awareness became alike some. You begin to think the same way. You begin to have the same passions. That's why you fell in love with each other. There was something about them that you liked, and it was probably part of you. 
and you get to the point where when you're older, I think when Don and I were probably 40s or 50s, we begin to say the very same thing at the very same time. We would be driving along and all of a sudden say, let's go to Brahms or let's go to this or go to that. And because we had this perfect marriage and oneness of mind. And that's what we want with our father. People say, well, how can I say what father says and do what father says like Jesus did as you stay in contact with father? And won't be long, whatever you say is what father would say. Whatever you do is what father would do. So we are one with Father, however, not very many, very many people know that fact and, and order them for them to enter into that rest because the church, uh, Western evangelical Christianity has always taught us that we're either sinners or sinners saved by grace. They taught us that we're not righteous, we're not holy. The scriptures translate that way where Jesus said all are called but few are chosen. That's, that's ridiculous. Why would Father call everybody but he only choose a few? That made us try to meet up with some kind of religious expectation. And so once we enter into this rest, which is like a marriage, you know, we enter into a rest with one another, then we can conceive or we can draw from the divine mind and then we have a perfect rest with Father. I have no fear from Father anymore. I have no fear if my body lets go of me, what's gonna happen afterwards. I don't worry about it. I don't have to even know. All I know is I will be with my Father and I will be with my loved ones that's passed on. So the Apostle Paul wrote in Hebrews, uh, for Father spake in certain places, and that would be, where did Father speak to people? In their awareness, right? In your individual awareness, of the seventh day. He spoke of that, of the seventh day. The seventh day was when Father physically, or, or whatever, spiritually, he rested from his act of creation. I don't think he was tired. I don't think it means that way. He rested in it. He enjoyed it. You know, when I, uh, I painted from October to mid probably July or whatever and that was my work and that work brought me great pleasure and there came a time that I thought okay I've done enough for now and I rested in that I did what I could not believe that I did and I have all those paintings they're hanging in people's houses that I don't even know to me that's what it means I rested in it it's it's what I meant to do is that is that how you would explain it does that make it simple to you and so <clears throat> we experience our marriage of being one and uh, it's important for us to do that. So what does the number seven symbolize? We've talked about it before, how it means perfection, right? And so in our previous, my previous book that I just released on Paul's Revelation and Bill, we saw where the Queen of Sheba, her Hebrew name means seven, uh, meaning seven is cyclical fullness or cyclic fullness, completeness, the fullness of time, fulfillment, an oath and a covenant. Sheba also represents rest, repose, stability, return to the original state, which I like that at all, a lot because, you know, Jesus was the only one that stayed in his original state in his world. We need to stay in our original state. I'm looking forward to when babies are born and the parents educate them enough that they stay in their original state. What's their original state? Sons and daughters of God. They're in total contact with Father and they realize Father is their eternal source. Seven also means completion and perfection and understanding and knowledge of what Father hath done. Mm -hmm. Not what Father's going to do, right? But what Father hath done yes. from the foundation. And we remember who we are. Remember what that came from? The word born again. Mm -hmm. When Jesus told Nicodemus, a man must be born again according to the King James, he was saying a man or a woman must remember who they are. And so then rest that rest comes from being the garden of Father. Garden, the garden to me is what Father does his beautiful work through. And then what do you do? You produce fruit. So I was thinking about this last, last night. Hi, Terry, Judy, good to see you. My wife Dawn and I dated, uh, and the longer we dated, the more awareness of our love for each other became evident. <clears throat> and there was a time of restlessness in our life because we thirsted for more, if I could say it that way. We wanted more than just holding hands and kissing. And so we loved each other and our greatest desire was to live with one another. And so it became very challenging to leave each other when I took her home at night to date. I remember sometimes Donna would cry and say, please don't leave me, honey. Is that a good, right? Am I correct? I don't remember that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I did. Oh, maybe it was me. <laughs> But we did not want to leave each other. We would hold each other tight. We would kiss. We, would, we didn't want to leave each other. Okay. And so 
it became challenging. I'm, I, I'm making this very mature. I'm not going to go where you think I'm going to go. But it became challenging for us to, to do that. So there came this time that we could enter into perfect rest with each other because we were married. We married one another. We moved into our house, which would I could say is a place of intimacy. We intimacy and rest. What are we? The house of Father, right? And Father lives in us. Father doesn't have to move in. Father already does. But when we realize that, there's a place of rest and intimacy with our Father. So what we did is we experienced our marriage feast of being one. Is that clean enough, Donna, for you? <laughs> so spiritually, the actual marriage... I was thinking about you the whole time I wrote this. <laughs> so spiritually, the actual marriage feast results from the awareness of one's eternal union with our Father. That's the marriage supper of the Lambkin. When this union awareness takes place, humankind may eat of the heavenly manna and drink the living water. And what is that? That's the rest. The, I love water. It's my favorite drink besides Dr. Pepper. I don't drink much Dr. Pepper. Uh, I've quit drinking a long time ago, but I love water. And when I have this thirst, I go get my cold water and I drink it. And I go, oh, it literally brings rest to my body because what percentage of our body is water? 93% something like that. Well, guess what? 100% of our body is spirit, is holy breath. And when we unite with a source of breath, what does it do? It's, oh, how many times have you left church before and said, oh, I felt so good today? When the, the, the praise, the singing was good, and you felt, you tapped into the very breath of God. I feel the goosebumps right now. And that's refreshing. So that's what this does for you. And it brings a, 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 a rest. So a thirsting for things of spirit or breath is necessary before coming to this spiritual marriage, uh, marriage feast. You have to thirst for it. We can't, nobody can just tell you to do it because we don't like to be told what to do anyways. But a lot of people think, well, I already have Holy Spirit. I talk in tongues or I do this. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a thirsting for that living water that comes inside of you that you can draw from. And that's why the Bible said the spirit in the bride or the breath in the bride are saying, come. We don't make you come, but we're saying, you know, you're, you know, I've talked to a lot of people. I counsel a lot of people on uh, FaceTime. And uh, I'm always saying the only thing that you need is, is, is uh, allow your awareness to raise up where you can come, in other words, in union with your Father and your understanding, and it will bring you peace. What happens then, that great desire that you desire for is the light, is the purity, and it's the justice of spirit power, and that's what draws humankind to Father when they realize that. So once we enter <clears throat> into marriage of our awareness with our divine mind, then the law of Moses and that of others, are the apostle, as the apostle wrote, is being dead. It has no more effect to you. Just like cocaine, I'm dead to cocaine. I've never even tried it. I never will. It's dead. I know nothing about it. I know nothing about a lot of things today. It's dead to me. And so <clears throat> our problem is many systems of religion resurrected the law, Right? After Jesus destroyed, uh, revealed its falsity and how it was damaging the people, religion continued to, to resurrect it. Mm -hmm. And then they interpenetrated it into our individual awareness. No matter what religion you go to, you're going to hear the law in one way or another. Some are real sweet about it. Some don't beat you up, but it's still there. It's still there. <laughs> and so it gets into your subconsciousness. It gets into your memories. And we ignorantly said, be it unto me, because we say, amen. I can't tell you how many times I said, amen, to something that was not true. That means, be it unto me. So, let me look at something here. <clears throat> I was thinking I might have skipped something, but I don't think I did. All right. So, what the man devised religious systems of this earth did is they overthrow, or do, is they overthrow our true faith. They overthrow our true faith, which should be our faith in Father's faith in us. Most of my life, I was trying to make my faith better. I always heard, well, your faith is not strong enough. The, the, uh, the word of faith, which I think is the Rhema, Bible called it, the word of faith. They put everything in your faith, and if something happens to you, then you just don't have enough faith. It's your fault, because it certainly isn't God's fault, right? So that's their mindset there. And so the Apostle Paul in uh, Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 15, he gave uh, Timothy some real instructions about how to be a true uh, teacher and a true pastor to the church. 
I liked one time when he told him, this time, because Timothy was a very young man, probably a teenager, I think he was, and his church or his uh, fellowship fell apart. And Paul said, next time get faithful men, faithful men, people, people that are faithful to the truth, faithful to the word, faithful to God. But here's a different situation he's at. In 2 Timothy 2.15, he wrote to Timothy, and I'm, I paraphrase this some, study to show yourself that Father is approved of you. A student of the living word will never be made to be ashamed by what religiousity teaches if they will rightly divide the word of truth and not the concealed written word. And isn't that true? If all you're studying is the written Bible, then you're going to be made ashamed by the teachers that preach sin consciousness because the written Bible confirms everything they said. Correct? And, and, and we know that because I get, when I try to teach people stuff, they always say, well, what about this verse? What about that verse? What? And I had to tell them, you've got to quit doing the what about mm -hmm. because we can spend a lifetime doing that. Let me show you what I've translated. Let me show you what I understand now. And then you won't be going, what about? You'll realize, well, that has something to do with awareness or it was mistranslated or it's a false perception. So he said, then, he, he then wrote in verse 16, but don't stand around listening to the Jewish notions, and this is actually a translation. Don't stand around listening to the Jewish notions and heathenish, heathenish with empty sounds and fruitless discussions and teachings of religiosity, for they will drive you forward unto more restlessness, resulting in more dead works of righteousness. Boy, did we do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we stood around, listened to them, and we shouted, and we went to the conferences, and it was so fun, and we just thought it was all good, and People were really feeling condemned, and man, it was awesome. It <laughs> made them feel guilty. Yeah, it was really awesome. Then verse 17, and what they say is like a deep ulcer producing gangrene. That's what it says. Wow. A deep ulcer producing gangrene that will devour your awareness of whom is Hymenius and Philetus. Those are the two people that did it. Paul called them out by name. I, I tell you, I don't know if we should be doing that or not, but we should, someday, it's got to, we got to tell people, you've got to stop going to that place because they're teaching you to lie. But they won't do it until they come to the end. So both of them uh, overthrew the real truthfulness of Father. That's what it said. That's what he told them. Both of them did. So they really affected the church at that time. That's why Timothy probably lost a lot of his con uh, congregation because these two men came in and sowed bad fruit. Mm. So Hymenius' name comes from Hymen, H-U-M-E-N, or human, meaning the good of weddings. So here again, we have, there's a fly in front of me. So here again, we have a wedding or a marriage. He was an opponent of those who were followers of what Jesus taught and what Paul was teaching. And again, he overthrew the faith. His name symbolizes a seemingly religious and spiritual thought activity that unifies itself with worldly reasoning. Mm -hmm. So they, they had... So they, they tapped in a little bit to spiritual, but they, they, they intermingled it with world understandings, with, uh, with uh, world reasonings, and with thoughts and desires of the outer man. Well, can we not see that in the church today? Mm -hmm. It's all been about the outer man, mm -hmm. all about getting wealth, all about getting healed, mm -hmm. all about pleasing God, all about getting a no, mm -hmm. nice home. I grew up with all that. And even trying to get healed mm -hmm. is dealing with the outer man. Mm -hmm. And so uh, <clears throat> what that would be is not being present with their divine mind. That's, that's what that would be. And so this is known as a marriage of sons and daughters of father with the world. Mm -hmm. And so we ministers perform marriages. We married people to the world. Mm -hmm. We married people to the carnal systems and the carnal understanding of, of, of the word. And so what they did, it led the individual i got to correct this here. The individual away from contact with the divine mind. And I never had contact with the divine mind. I did, but I never was aware why I was in religiosity. I, I, I always thought I had Christ in me. I thought I had Jesus within me. And I was always trying to approach Jesus for everything. And I never really approached the divine mind. And so that's that truth of the living word. And what it did, it brought us into an abandonment abandonment of the word and the hardships it brings. What are the hardships? Lack, a sense of lack in everything. You know, bankruptcies, uh, making more loans, suffering things from many physicians, divorce, relationship problems, all kinds of stuff.
and it was a great hardship. So now I want to explain this in Hosea. Hosea, Hosea chapter 2, verse 14. I'll give you a second to change there. I'm going there, Don, if you're going there. Hi, Teresa Gregory. Glad to see you're here today. I knew if I talked about marriage today, there would be a whole lot of women on here. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. You have it? Yeah, chapter 2, 14 through 15. The messenger Hosea, they're not prophets like we say always. They're actually messengers from Father. And he spoke what Father spoke to his thoughts, that Father would allure Israel and bring her into a place of being alone with him. Every place you see the word desert, it actually means a place of being alone or being quiet. Jesus went into the desert to be alone and to talk and listen to his Father. And so he did this to bring Israel to this place of being alone and it said he could speak comfortably unto her individual awareness. And I like that word comfortably because when Father speaks, it's not hard. It's not fearful. It brings you peace, right? Mm -hmm. When I hear my wife's voice, it's comfortable to me. When, we, when we're out somewhere and walking around, there's a big crowd and Donna says something, even if she's talking to somebody else, I'm familiar with her voice and I hear her voice. And that makes me want to run to her, if you would. <laughs> and so he said that they would be given vineyards. He said they would be given vineyards, and we know what a vineyard is. It's something to feed from. And a door of uh, a vineyards and the valley of Achor, A-C-H-O-R. And I looked that up, and it means in the veil of trouble. So he would give them vineyards and the valley of, of Achor for a door of hope. Mm -hmm. She shall pay attention and heed, not seeing, but heed to my love and words there, as in the day when she came out of Egypt. So let me tell you what these words mean again. Accor means in the veil of trouble. Well, where is this world system at right now? It is a veil, it's, it's not the real, but it's in trouble. And in other words, to me, what this really speaks to me is in the midst of all this, I'm given a door of hope. Yes. A door of hope. Mm -hmm. And you know what that is? It, when you look it up, it's a threefold cord. The word hope is a threefold cord. And when you enter into that door and that threefold cord we know is strong, it says she shall pay attention and heed. That's what the word sing means. She will pay attention to me and she will listen to me, to my love and my words, as in the day when she came out of Egypt, which was worldly carnal carnalness. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. The day I came out of worldly carnalness, I obeyed Father. In other words, I listened with intelligence. And this is the same thing right here that Isaiah was saying to the people. I love that when I looked that up. So people often ask me, how can we live apart from the trouble that often goes on the world system? Some people don't understand why I still make mention of it, why I still sometimes say we should buy American-made products and stuff. Uh, a sister asked me why, why we want to make America great again. That doesn't fit with what we teach or whatever. But if we're not great, we can't help anybody. And we, we are spiritual beings, and we live in a physical world, and we're to bless and to affect the spiritual world. Yeah. So if America is not a producing country, and all we do is consume, we're not going to help people. And as I pointed out, we do send billions, if not trillions of dollars all over the world. But guess what? The people that need it are not getting it. That's right. When that great earthquake hit Haiti many years ago, the Clinton Foundation raised millions and millions of dollars, and hardly any of it went to them. Right? Mm -hmm. And so we do need to pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to just be, because the problem is the church has always been worried more about flying away and not caring about the world. Mm -hmm. That's why the world's in the shape it's in right now today. Yes. But Hosea gave this instruction and, uh, to answer their question. The trouble is just a veil. It's nothing. It's less than nothing. It's not a power to those who were, will enter in and feed from the vineyard, if you would. Would, would, would enter into that, the strength of that threefold cord. And so our outward supply and our eternal supply would be the vineyard. And, and our books, uh, uh, Living Out of Our Spiritual Resources, I've been going through those. I'm going to put them on our Lulu pages. And I just really enjoyed the, uh, our study that chapter 10, True Supply. So our true supply would be the vineyard, right? You know, if I wanted apples and I grew an apple tree, that apple tree would be my supply for apples. I mean, the source is our father, but our true supply. So 
the the door of hope is a threefold cord, and the strength of the threefold threefold cord is our faith in Father's faith, and it's what Father declared over us from eternity, and that is we lack nothing. When Father imaged mankind under this planet, everything man would ever need was there already, right? He never said, oh, I forgot they need sunshine, or I, I forgot they need water, or I forgot they needed meat, or whatever it is that they needed. And he, he provided it, and he, he also he didn't say, oh, I forgot to put my spirit in them. Because many people will teach that you do not have Holy Spirit in you until you talk in tongues, and that's just ludicrous. So we lack nothing. So next in verse 16 we read, And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that you shall call me Ishi. I-S-H-I, Ishi. And you know what it means? My husband. My husband. Huh? My husband. My husband. Does that what it showed in your... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that book shows, the Bible translation shows some good things. And shall call me no more Baal. What, is it? what does it show there, Donna? Does it show it? More. Master. Master, like he's our master. A master is what a slave calls, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's what... I, and so... And then in verse 17, he said, For I will take away the names of ba ba Balaam, master, out of your mouth, and they shall no more re be remembered by that name. In other words, I will no more re be remembered by that name. You will never call me master again. I am your husband. Right? We, we say father. We got these little dinky flies that keep coming in, and they just drive me nuts. <coughs> Unless it's floaters. I don't think it is. I don't see it. <laughs> it's a little bitty one. It's a fly. <laughs> but so in this text here, this text is a visionary of the time in which we are now. It's the time when we realize and demonstrate that we are no longer servants or slaves or fathers. We're no longer just sinners saved by grace and volatile to the mood of God. One day he loves me, one day he doesn't. You know, one day I do something that's just really, really big and another day... I do something that's really great, so he's going to be blessed me now, and he's going to take away from me there. Most people live there still to this day. So this is the time when the marriage of the lambkin, mankind and father, come together, shall have taken place in our conscious awareness. We're already together, but we, father already has awareness, but we come together in our conscious awareness, and we understand that, and we, we shall have entered into this abiding realization of our oneness, and it's our perfect union, or our perfect contact with indwelling divine mind. And we stay, we don't come in and out like we used to do at church. We go to revivals, get all, all pumped up and excited, or go to church camp, get all excited, and then go home, and day after day, it just lessens and lessens and lessens. The next thing you know, boy, I wish they'd have another revival. I wish we could have church camp again. Well, you know, you don't need that. You just need contact with Father. And then when you do go, you will be a blessing to people, not taking from people. So, <clears throat> Holy breath is then to us our illuminating principle. Holy breath is our wisdom, our understanding, our husband, Ishi. And we no longer see Father as a God in a sense of a master. That's why I do not like to use the word God anymore. I try not to use that in my Bible. Why? Because we exist as sons and daughters of the Most High. He's our husband, Father. And, and again, there's no gender in Father, but what a husband means, a husband supplies all your needs. We're supposed to have done do that. You know, when I married, we were kind of, I was kind of old fashioned. My job was to supply for my wife and my children. I never asked her to work. She worked a few times because she wanted to. And if she wanted to work all the time, she could have, but I didn't expect her to because I knew that was my calling to support my children. Well, that's my husband and father. Mm -hmm. My father said, we, and I, and I, I know, I, I know people are upset with it, but, but it, nevertheless, Jesus is not our supply. Jesus was the greatest comforter master teacher, master teacher there ever was. And to his world, he was the way, he was the truth, he was the life. But later on, John said, now the true light of the world shines, and that's us. Mm -hmm. you know. And we, we're going forth saying, Father is your supply. And he's already supplied you already. So we should never ask for anything unless it's just say, Father, help me with more wisdom and understanding that I can lead the people that I minister to. So Romans 7, 4. Go back to Romans 7, 4, if you have my translation. If you don't, just listen. <clears throat> Waiting on my honey. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Romans chapter 7, 4. 
You can now see how, since the husband died, his death freed his wife from being bound to him her entire life. In the same manner, also, you can see how the law to which you were previously joined has no more effect on you. We know this because of what Jesus revealed in his incarnational event, and I am explaining. Paul, he has shown us that, that the system of the Mosaic law and all its dictates were not from our Father. So now that you know and understand the truth of what Jesus revealed, the rules of the Mosaic law are now dead to you. You're no longer bound to the Mosaic law. You're fully aware now that you can tread about in life as holy breath been married to Father. You are one with our Father Creator. There is an even greater truth concerning who we eternally are, which Jesus' resurrected, resurrection revealed, and it is this. From everlasting to everlasting, we should bring forth much spiritual fruit as Father personified in our body, just as Jesus brought forth much spiritual fruit. And see, to me, I think a lot of people think when they get saved or whatever, they're expecting all kinds of stuff to come to them. But when you finally accepted who you are, your job is to bear forth fruit, right? And so, as I wrote earlier, when Don and I married, we entered into rest with each other and something came forth. It was fruit. It was the fruit of our union. We produced fruit. That was the newness of life, if you would. We, their names were Angela, Nathan, and Allison. And from then for, uh, came forth nine more fruit. Our grandchildren, Zane, Alexander, Quaid, Paya Jade, Camille, Joel, Grace, and Silas, and Prince Ethan Edward. That's my grandson. He got my middle name, so I put Prince on, Prince on there. So spiritually, the thirst and the yearning we have will bring forth much fruit. I don't kid about this. It is the truth. When I married Donna, I swear when I said I do, she thought I said, yes, you can get pregnant. Because she thirsted for a child. She wanted a child. And within probably just a few months, we decided we would go ahead and try to conceive. And the first couple of months that she didn't, she cried. She was all upset because she thirsted for a child. She was hungry for a child. That's what we're hungry. You think there's a hunger in you for food or whatever? No, there's a hunger in you to bear forth fruit, to shine the love of God on all the earth. That's what that's for. So why does it take time? It took time, right? We didn't decide we want a child, have, have a relationship, and boom, tomorrow we had a baby. Because good fruit does not show up on a tree in one day. No more did our fruit from our union come in one day. They took nine months to grow. And when they did, what did they do? They showed forth their glory. And so nine is the number for the fruit of holy breath. It's the number for divine completeness for Father. Nine is the result of three times three, which is also three is divine completeness, perfection, and resurrection. So our fruit in us is ready to produce. It's ready to produce. Uh, and, but there needs to be a time for planning our awareness. So how does that happen? Well, we, we uh, make contact with our Father. We live and move and have our being out of Father. and We let Father do the same thing. And what happens is that brings forth a life of permanence and an energy that produces fruit in due season, or I could say fruit that remains. Right? We want good fruit. Mm -hmm. So the fatherly are the which I would say the progenerator quality that must have its place in every spiritual thought in us is that we are not lacking fruitfulness. You are not barren. You're not barren because you have the, the very fruit of God within inside of you. You have everything that you need to produce good fruit to people. So in other words, that our authentic impulses and convictions may bring fruit, we must recognize them as being our children. We become the bread. We become what people want to feed on. We become the bread of life. And so our children, if we love our children, what do we do? We nurture them. And so we feed what's within us. How do we do that? We meditate on the word day and night, the rest of the time, do what you want. We, we, we listen to comforter messengers. We take notes. We, we get the books. We get the notes. We study. We feed and we ask, Father, give me a full understanding of this, Father, because I know there's a world out there in my world that needs what I have and I need understanding. I want to be able to explain things. You know, Ann told me, Carl, that your friend Terry was listening to me and he said he had a lot of questions. Well, are you comfortable in answering them yet? 
You don't know. <laughs> but the truth is we need to get where we're comf comfortable in answering the questions. So you saw it too, didn't you? So I don't believe Father will cause anybody to ask us a question that we don't know already. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it'll never happen. But most of the time when you, I go out in the world or somebody writes me, they ask me a question. I just studied it last week or I just heard the answer last week because Father knows who's going to come, right? Father knows everything. And so this, what, what we do here is we, some persons literally will come along and they'll quote others talking about the truth. They're you know, like, my pastor said, you know, or whatever, but they never speak the truth out boldly as Jesus and Paul did. And that's what we want to do is to be able to speak the truth out boldly. You know, I appreciate Valerie Robinson several years ago. She, she complimented me and told me I was full of it. And I appreciate that compliment because I am full of it. And, and when people ask questions, it begins to flow out of me. And, and I, I love it. And I love how when I study, it just comes to me. Father, several years ago, told me I could quit transcribing for Brother Garner and that from now on, he would dictate to me. And he's faithfully done that to me. And so I boldly can tell you that whatever I'm saying, it's Father saying it. Father said it to my thoughts. So uh, we get to that place where we can literally say, thus saith the Lord within me. Isn't that better? I can literally say, thus saith the Lord in me. Father, God has always loved you. Thus saith the Lord. And we could just go on and on and on. So in closing, the seed in man is planted in the living word. And the ideas and thoughts accepted and appropriated by mankind are seeds that bear fruit in our life to give out to our world. Everything that comes to us should go through us. People that give money, they recognize the spiritual law that as you give out, it just keeps coming, right? We've, we've, we've experienced that and I hope many people have. Or whatever it is that you have to give, if you give out, it keeps coming. So when we gladly receive the uh, seed of living word, we bring forth fruit of a hundredfold. One last thing, uh, Macedonia was a city uh, which Paul and Silas went to escape persecution from Thessalonica. They had a lot of persecution in what they taught. And Macedonia stands for enthusiasm, enthusiasm uh, the fervor of the soul and its thirst for spiritual understanding and the power that comes from knowing the truthful word. So by experience, any phase of man's consciousness, they must be watered again with a, with, a, with a living word or the truth, which is the seed, and it takes root and it brings forth much fruit. So we are chosen by our Father then as a medium. You know, there are a lot of people today that seek mediums to, to contact people who are dead or whatever, but, but we are a medium of Father to express Father to express love, to express wisdom, to express abundance, to express health, and much more. And I like what Jesus said in John 15. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you that you should go and do what? Bear fruit. So that's our whole purpose. So again, the problem with Western evangelical Christian system is they taught us that Jesus was the one who would give us fruit, and Father would give us daily fruit, and the truth is we are the fruit bearing part of the relationship. You know, I don't have it where I can read it, but my translation of, of the Lord's prayer was the same way. He did not say, give us this day our daily bread. He didn't say anything like that. So we're the bread, we're the vine, we're the manna, we're the feast, and we can produce good fruit for those who are thirst or hunger. So if you take this and meditate on it, we listen to it again. Uh, hi, Daryl. We will I will uh, load it to YouTube pretty soon. I've been kind of slack on that because of what I've been dealing with, but I'll put those on YouTube. If you want the transcript and you're not in our transcript group, all you have to do is donate at least $10 a month. And every Sunday that I teach, I will give you a full transcript of everything I taught. You can study it, you can learn it, and you can go forth and teach it to your world. So we love you. We thank you very much. And we will see you next Sunday. Thanks for being here.